Which is the best investment for you, Pfizer or Merck? Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the fundamentals analyzer software tool, a.k.a. Mr. Valuation. So if you were interested in investing in a real high-quality, large pharmaceutical company, two of your primary choices would be Pfizer or Merck. Merck, of course, being the largest. So which one of these investments would suit you better as an investor? With this video, I'm going to try to answer those questions for you, and I am going to give you a clue. The answer is it depends on what your goals, objectives, and risk tolerances are. So as usual, let's turn to fast graphs and dig into these two companies. We're going to start here by taking a look at Pfizer. And the first thing I want to do with this particular graphic is I want to scroll down here to the bottom, and I want to take price off the graph. And I'm also going to take the normal PE off. What I want you to understand is, first of all, what this orange line represents. It represents a fair value reference line at a P.E. ratio of 13.18, applying the Graham-Dodd formula. Because Pfizer, as you can see, is a very low growth stock. Now, one of the beauties of fast graphs, you can look at numbers like that and see statistics in most other sites. And this is a statistic, historical growth including the forecasting data here, would have been averaging 2.34% going all the way back to 2003. But this is an analytical tool, this thing called fast graphs, and it's the dynamic nature of it and why it makes it so much easier for investors to analyze stocks when they have it, the opportunity of subscribing to this tool. So let's use the scroll bar here, and let's first of all go back and scroll back to the peak of Pfizer's earnings when they earned $6.58 in 2022. And this, of course, was primarily attributed to the vaccines that Pfizer was offering for COVID. All right, so we had this huge surge. We had a 99% and then a 49% respectively increase in earnings from their previous year, 2019, in which included COVID. Now all of a sudden we've got 7.42% growth. So again, just looking at statistics on a page without having the dynamic ability to analyze where that growth is coming from is critical because I moved this up forward one year and all of a sudden the growth now turns negative. So you had a $2.02 .02 in 2005 that fell to $1.84. But again, I moved this along another year or two and all of a sudden I've got some estimate data here where the earnings growth will be a little higher. And then finally, when I go fully to the estimates, I get growth of 1.42%. My point is that as I look at all this data here, it changes according to what time frame I'm looking at. And I think that's critically important, not to just look at some statistics on a page, but be able to analyze how and why those statistics are what they are. Where did the growth come from? What was the result of the growth and why? Now, the same is also true, in my view, about valuation. Now, this line represents a fair valuation reference line, as I pointed out on the maximum view here of 13.18. Again, I want to make something real clear before I go on. If I drop this back to the 7.42% growth, now all of a sudden this value reference line changes to a PE of 15, which applying the Graham Dodd formula with that kind of growth would apply. So again, it's the different time frames give you different data points that you can evaluate and analyze as you look at these graphs. So the next, let's put the price on because you can't really estimate or understand valuation unless you have both price and fundamentals. Right now, we just have fundamentals. We have earnings and we have dividends, which is the white line on the graph. So let's add the price line. Okay, now if I look at the max time frame, the first thing I notice is the value, the price was way above the value line in this case. All right, so this was starting out at a very overvalued period. Now that would have given you a valuation headwind where you'd have actually lost money owning Pfizer over this time frame, even though they did generate some decent earnings growth and even though they did pay a dividend along the way, although they did reduce their dividend coming out of the Great Recession twice until they started growing it again back in 2011 and 2012. Again, the analytical ability to just instantly view this is such a powerful advantage that you can have. 
Now, if I checked rate of return from the bottom, and by the way, they don't ring a bell at the top or bottom of markets, but in hindsight, you can see tops or bottoms. But if I look at this from the standpoint of being trading at only a P.E. ratio of under 5, when fair value would indicate a 13 P.E., and I look at it going to a 13 P.E. out here, all of a sudden, if I calculate my rate of return, I've got a 14% annualized rate of return because valuation matters, and it matters a lot, even with very little growth during this period of time. But on the other hand, if I bought the stock at fair value, or paid closer to a 13 PE, here's 12.5, and held it out to here, my rate of return gets cut in half to 7.4%. It's not enough to know what your track record of the company has been from a standpoint of price performance alone. It's also critical to know where and how that was generated how much of it came from growth, how much of it came from P.E. ratio expansion, and how much of it came from dividend income. That's another major advantage that this tool gives. But now let's go ahead and go on with Pfizer here. The vaccines gave them a big surge in earnings, but now that that's over and COVID has passed and people aren't being vaccinated as much, we saw earnings move back to a more normalized level, but they are expected to begin growing in the future. So let's look at the future here of Pfizer real quickly. Let's go into the forecasting calculators. And of course, we're coming off a real negative year, but coming off of that negative year, we are expecting a 25% rate of change or growth rate for this year that we're currently in. And this has a December fiscal year. And then we're expecting another, analysts, I should say, are expecting another 18%-ish growth for 2025, followed by 6% growth. Now, here, that would indicate a 14.61% growth rate, and adding these three numbers up here, and that gives us a 15 PE because that is below 15% growth. So if I just pointed to the 15 PE, that would mean Pfizer could give me an opportunity for a 22% annualized rate of return, including dividends. If I move to the normal multiple, which has been below 15 Okay, I look at that, I would still have a double-digit annualized rate of return. But here's the other kicker I want you to basically understand. This company offers a current dividend yield of almost 6%, 5.92%. You can buy it at a P.E. of 14.12, which is slightly higher than their normal P.E. of 11.9, but and only slightly higher than their Graham Dodd affected formula. But when I go into forecasting, I want you to note that this growth rate would indicate a 15 PE, all right? And that would give me my 22% annualized return. But here's the point that I want to make. If I'm an investor right now looking for income and dividend yield, I think Pfizer is attractively valued here, assuming these analyst estimates are correct. And obviously, I can get almost a 6% dividend yield and that might be very attractive to me if I needed the current income to support my lifestyle, if I was in that position. If I had a lot of assets and didn't need that higher rate of return, then a company like Merck, which we'll get into here in a moment, might make more sense. But right now, if I was looking for high income, Pfizer would be excellent. And if I was looking for good value, Pfizer also looks like it's attractively valued here. It's not dirt cheap, but it's trading below its theoretical fair value reference line. And even if I do apply the normal multiple, it's still basically in line with that, just slightly above that, and that would still give me a decent chance to make some money. Now, I would have the 6% plus dividend yield, but I would also have the opportunity for some capital appreciation. Now, looking at analyst estimates record on Pfizer, I think it's important to also recognize that the analysts have a very excellent record. For the one year forward with a 10% margin of error, analysts have only missed it 17% of the time. And then for the two year forward, they've also only missed it 17% of the time. So generally, analysts get it right. And most of the time when they're wrong, the error is actually almost insignificant. Although it was greater in 2020, and it was really pretty bad in 2023. But that, again, could be attributed to the fact that we had this huge drop in earnings because all of a sudden the vaccine business went away. And by the way, one of their cohorts that they even cooperated with 
uh, during the COVID pandemic was Moderna. And Moderna is an interesting case because here you see a company that had nothing going on profit-wise, had a big surge in earnings coming out of COVID because of the vaccines, but their earnings have now also tailed off, but now expectations are for no earnings. So here we don't have much in the way of fundamentals, but I thought that would be interesting for you all to look at and see. And of course, this company doesn't even pay a dividend. So anyway, that's Moderna. Now, moving on to Merck, let's look at Merck fundamentally from some different points of view. Merck offers a 2.39% dividend. The blended PE is 31, but that's a little bit misleading, okay, because the company had this huge drop in earnings. Now, if I look at all levels of earnings, I can look at another advantage of fast growth. I can look at basic earnings, which includes a lot of write-offs and things. This company's made many acquisitions, and the same would be true of diluted earnings. All right, so adjusted earnings give me a little better look, but I want you to note that the market seemed to totally ignore this big drop in earnings. Now, I went to the 10K, and I would suggest you do this yourself, and you can look at why did the earnings fall so dramatically. Now, I'm just going to give you some bullet points here, but the 10K does summarize this very nicely. But first of all, total R&D expenses increased to $30.5 billion in 2023, up from $13.5 billion in 2022. The major charges were $10 billion for acquiring Prometheus, $5.5 billion for a collaboration with Dachi Sanko, I guess a Japanese company, $1.2 billion for acquiring Imago, in comparisons to 2022, where they had $690 million in charges for collaborations and licenses with Moderna, Orner Therapeutics, and Orion. Additional expect factors were higher development spending on newly acquired programs. Now, I just want to interject that a lot of the drop here had to do with preparing for future growth going forward. And there was also additional increased compensation and benefits to the rise in headcount in the firm. And offsets were lower intangible asset impairment charges compared to 22. And then if you look at a breakdown of the R&D expenses, they had $8 billion for Merck Research Labs in 2023, up from $7.7 billion, which is not too terrible in 2022. They had $20.7 billion in aggregated costs from animal health research, collaboration, upfront payments, acquisitions, and support from other divisions in 2023, significantly higher than $4.1 billion in 2022. As far as impairment charges, it was $779 million in 2023, primarily related to Gex the PN, which again is another acquisition. They had $1.7 billion, largely related to a drug. And then as far as for traditional future outlook, as far as potential for additional impairment charges, if other pipeline programs are canceled or delayed, would be a potential risk. So we can understand why the obvious drop in earnings happen now. And so we want to look to the future. Let's put it more into practical terms by going into the forecasting graph like I did with Pfizer. So we're expecting a huge increase in earnings here. But I do want to point out, this is simply earnings moving back into more normalized ranges after these, all these write-offs I just articulated a moment ago. And then we're looking at earnings growing at 14% and then 8%. Okay, so this 43% number is a little bit misleading, and I would then, therefore, being an analyst and looking at this, saying, well, I don't think a 30 PE, which is what this fair valuation reference line would indicate, we cap it at 30. We don't feel like you could ever pay more than 30 times earnings, but in some cases you do. The growth rate here is 43, so we're using the P equals growth rate formula. But if I went to a normal 15 PE, which is what I think this company would basically indicate at these levels, then I'd be looking at an 11% rate of return going forward. Compared to Pfizer, as I pointed out, looking at Pfizer going to a 15 PE would give me a 22% annualized rate of return with a much higher dividend yield. So it's not just statistics that you want to look at, it's what the relative valuation is in the potential growth and how and where the potential growth is coming from. I think those are very important and critical factors to take into consideration. Looking at Merck's analyst scorecard, it's quite a bit better than Pfizer's on the one year forward, 17% versus 8% on a forward. So this is a company that has a pretty good analyst scorecard record, but so does Pfizer. 
So looking at these companies, it's a matter of where the current valuation is, what the future growth is. Pfizer has been a much slower grower than Merck in recent years. And again, I can use the dynamic nature of fast graphs. Now we got 6.8% growth when I go back to 08. If I go to 15 years, we're at 7% growth. Understanding these different growth rates, if I look more recently, Merck, Merck has been growing, at, is expected to give us an average of 12.6% versus Pfizer giving us a much lower number. So when you look at these two companies, they are both very high quality. Merck is A-plus rated with 41% debt to, to capital. If I go to Pfizer, Pfizer is A-rated with 38%, we'll call it, debt to capital. Again, Pfizer offers a, almost a 6% yield, where Merck offers only a 2.39%. Both of these stocks are, I think, reasonably valued today and do offer opportunities going forward. Now, there's also some crazy stuff that you can look at. I call it crazy. For example, if I go into external links and go into Yahoo Finance and look at Merck, and by the way, it's up 1% as I'm doing this video, 1.1%. If I go into analysis here, I can get other estimate data from a different set of estimates that Yahoo gets for compared to the fact set estimates we get on fast graphs. And here I'm looking at earnings estimates that are very similar to what you see on fast graphs. But if I look at the next five years, you get a 66.74% growth rate for Merck and company. If I go to fast graphs and go into forecasting and go into the long-term expected growth, I get that very similar number. And this is the game chart. I don't know what the analysts see here, why they expect such high growth coming out of Merck where if I go back into Pfizer here and go into forecasting and look at long-term growth, they're only expected 13.78%. And once again, I can go into Yahoo estimates, and this is the kind of stuff you've got to deal with as an analyst and look at what analysts think on Pfizer. We get similar estimates for the next couple of years, but again, if I look at the next five years, they expect negative growth on Pfizer. So... Are these analysts right or wrong? I don't really put too much weight into these longer-term forecasts. I think forecasting is always an uncertainty. Like I always say, the, the only thing certain about the future is uncertainty. I'm more comfortable sticking to these closer estimates. But it is another piece of information that not only you need to evaluate, but you'd want to ask the question, why do they expect such growth out of Merck? And, of course, the answer to that is, is to go directly, and again, Fastgrass facilitates that, go directly into the company's website, and then you can go in and look at things like, go into their menu here and go into investor services, and there's all kinds of information here, events and presentations. You can see what the company's expecting and why they're expecting it. You could do, of course, the same thing with Pfizer by going into their corporate website, and you can, again, go to investor services and look for their stuff. You also have choices. For example, you can go into places like Morningstar and look and see what Morningstar thinks about the company. They give Pfizer a five-star rating, and they give it a fair value of 42 and a current price of 38. Where in contrast, if we look at what they're saying on Merck right now, we find that they give it a three-star rating, and they say fair value is 120, and they would call it overvalued. And, of course, that's, I think, impacted by the fact that we've got this drop in earnings that we saw here is obviously impacting their attitude. But the point is, it's always a puzzle investing. Now, other things that I would do with fast graphs before I finish this is I would go through and I would look at cash flows, and I would try to ascertain dividend coverage on both companies I would look at it from a standpoint of, I would look at Merck, and then I would also go in here and look at Pfizer and see what their operating cash flows look like relative to dividend coverage. And of course, I got a little dicey here, but it's expected to grow very much. So bottom line is, if I was investing or considering investing in these stocks, I'd look at Merck potentially for maybe more growth potential, although not necessarily so. It depends on what those analysts see in the long term. I'd look at Pfizer more for the income, but I would consider both of them very high-quality stocks that you could invest in that both look like they're at decent value today. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. I want to thank you for watching this video. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do. 
and give me a like, if you will, and also take a look at Fastgrass. I call Fastgrass the value investor's best friend, and it makes it so much easier to evaluate stocks. And rather than just get a bunch of information, Fastgrass can also bring wisdom to the party, and wisdom is much more important than information, in my opinion. Thanks for watching and talk to you again real soon.